Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another one of our programs, Hajj Day Today. This is coming to you live and direct from Mina. And what makes this program even more exclusive is that it can only be seen on Huda TV. Now, Hajj Day Today is a series of programs running up until the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. And what we do in this program, effectively, we look at the topic of Hajj and we look at a connecting subject to it and we discuss the two together. Yesterday, we had a look at Hajj and the day of Arafat and it was a fantastic discussion where we discussed the topic from a different number of different angles and we covered all of them alhamdulillah today we're going to look at Hajj and the topic of equality What's it? Equality. Equality. equality that's right so we're going to be having a look at Hajj and equality so but before we begin I would like to remind our viewers that the number is running across the screen so do contact us Give us your phone calls and give us your comments and give us your thoughts. Furthermore, you can also contact us via Facebook and Twitter. So let's get into the subject. It's late in the evening, so let's get started, inshallah. Let's begin by introducing our guests. If I could begin by introducing our guest on the right, Sheikh Muhammad Salah, who is very popular on Huda TV and has his own program on there answering people's questions. Ask Huda, I'd like to welcome you to the program today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And Dr. Muhammad Saeed, welcome to the program. I'd like to give you a warm welcome this time. Yeah, welcome, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam to Allah. And to my left, we have Sheikh Shafi Al Qahdani. I'd like to welcome you to the program and also, Assalamu alaikum. Wa salam, thank you. Glad to be with you. Okay, uh, if we can begin, uh, the first question the definition of equality, Sheikh, what is it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I praise Allah the Almighty alone and send up his peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest man who established equality on earth via presentation and action okay. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was the greatest role model in this regard. Uh, it is best to define it from the sunnah because it's easy to fish it in any dictionary, okay. English dictionary. In the Sunnah, I'd like to quote a hadith. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, none of you would truly believe unless he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Okay. So liking for others, liking to treat others the same way you like to be treated, it goes both ways. Liking to respect others the same way you like to be respected, that is called equality. Okay. And not to make distinction between people based on position nor position. Rather, the distinction would be only determined by Allah based on a factor that no one can claim, which is piety and righteousness. That's okay. why the ayah of Surah Al Hujurat, Allah the Almighty refers to that by saying, In akramakum inda Allahi at and the introduction of the ayah explained that all mankind were created from a single male and female. You happen to be of dark skin. Okay. Somebody else happened to be with fair complexion, blue eyes, black eyes, curly hair. It doesn't matter. In Arafah, after a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave his farewell speech, look at this, look at this demonstration of equality. He said, and there was about 124,000 companions perform in Hajj with him. He said, where is Usama ibn Zayd? Usama ibn Zayd is the son of Zayd ibn Haritha, who was a slave. Okay. And Usama was exceedingly black, with curly hair. Okay, because many of us think that Usama, the Prophet loved him because he was like handsome and so on. No, Usama, alhamdulillah, shukrullah, he was handsome because of his manners. So he said, where is Usama? They call Usama, he said, you get to ride with me on the same mount, on the same camel. What an honor. All the companions and out of his family members, he did not choose one of his family members first. Al-Bayt, he said, where is Usama? You come and ride with me. فَأَرْدَفَهُ خَلْفَهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Then when they spent the night in Muzdalifah, uh, upon leaving, he said, where is Al-Fadl? Al-Fadl was his cousin, Al-Fadl ibn al-Abbas. He said, you come and ride with me and so on. So this is an actual demonstration of a person who is an honorable person from the tribe of Quraysh and a person who was a slave. That is called equality. Okay. There is of course more, but I love to hear from my uh, dear uh, colleagues. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad, if I can elaborate on that, uh, on that point and ask you, 
What exactly is uh, equality based upon? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Labbayk Allahumma labbayk. Labbayk la sharika laka labbayk. Inna alhamd wa ni'mat laka wa al-mulk. La sharika lak. And this is a symbol of equality among all the pilgrims who pronounce the same phrase uh, all over the valleys here and on all mountains, um, uh, repeating the same words, all equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the basis of equality is not a tradition or a common practice or a law. The source of equality in Islam comes from the basic sources of the Sharia. Ah which are the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad The Qur'an set out the boundaries in, uh, in matters of rules and norms and the Prophet وسلم, exemplified that in practice as the Sheikh mentioned. Okay. And this type of equality was actually uh, the Prophet وسلم, was a model in giving in numerous examples of how did he treated his companions? How did he treated his wives? And how the Prophet Sallallahu set a balance in the relationship between masters and slaves in a community or a society which was which has that type of people. Uh, and a part of those examples is the hadith of Abu Dharr. May Allah be pleased with him. Uh, when he uh, met with Bilal ibn Rabah and he called him names. Because actually, uh, Bilal was formerly a slave. Okay. And then he was freed. So the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam reprimanded Abu Dharr and approached him in a very, in a way that he was so angry. And he said, Did you call him names? Uh, and he set up that balance of brotherhood, which is based on equality. It's not just theoretical brotherhood that the Prophet وسلم, labeled the Sahaba. And he said, Ikhwanukum khawalukum. Your uh, servants are your brothers. Ja'alahum Allahu tahta aydikum. Faman kana, and, and, and before that, the Messenger وسلم, made a very critical comment, which he said that, Ya Aba Dhar, a'ayyartahu bu ummi, innaka mru'un fika jahiliya. O Abu Dhar, you still have some of the remnants of Jahiliyyah. Okay. And this is a, a, a point which uh, indicates that inequality or injustice or that type, the society of ranking, in fact, belongs to the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. Right. What do they use actually to rank people? And amazingly to tell you that, Abu Dhar responded to the Prophet wasallam. He put his face on the ground and he said, I will never ever leave it or raise it until Bilal kicks it with his own feet. Right. This is a matter which, which shakes the heart. Because in the, in the situation, it means that uh, he wants to strike an example that he submitted to the commands of the Prophet. ﷺ. So if you read the seerah of the Messenger, وسلم, and if you read in the passages of the Quran, you will find that it embodies the uh, ideal examples of equality. So whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a preference, it is the one who is preferred. And whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a specific position, this is the ideal position for him. Right. That's why there is a difference between equality and justice. Okay. Justice or equity means that you put everything in its appropriate position. But equality is not actually admitted in all situation for all positions and in all circumstances and okay. this is what we will discuss in shop okay thank you very much uh, if i could turn my attention to you sheikh shafi uh, i want to take this point of racism a little bit further what did islam teach us about the difference between a white person and a black person or an arab and a non-arab okay bismillah alhamdulillah salat salam ala rasulullah Islam does not make any discrimination on the basis of color or race. Right. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated in the verse that was recited by Shaykh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya khalaqnakum min untha wa ja'annakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila ta'arabu. Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh people, we have created you from single male and female. Right. And from them we have created nations and tribes that you might know each other. Okay. The most honorable of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most pious. So this is the criteria. Okay. Regardless of the color or the race. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has firmly denounced any kind of discrimination. As in the story that the Sheikh, you know, narrated to us and many other incidents and occasions. And this was deeply rooted in the hearts of, Prophet, of the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the extent, just commenting on the, on, on the issue that the Sheikh talked about Bilal, just to do something that Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, got married to the sister of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Okay. And she was from a noble tribe of Quraysh. Another incident, Zayd ibn Harith, may Allah be pleased with him. He got married to Zainab bin Jahsh. Okay. Then he divorced her and the Prophet ﷺ got married to her. So these are you know, two indicators that this kind of discrimination was totally removed from the hearts of the companions after Islam. Such, a, such marriages wouldn't have happened before Islam. Subhanallah. This was not totally accepted, but Prophet Muhammad as, as, uh, as in, uh, in this hadith, many hadith, he has demolished all, uh, all kinds of discrimination based on the color of race. Another incident, which happened to, uh, to uh, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him when he was a caliph. Okay. He, ha he has appointed a governor on Mecca, the city. And one day, he decided to make a journey to Mecca, and he met the governor on his way. So he asked, asked him a question, who have you appointed you know, during your absence? He said, a slave of mine. Of mine. He could be a slave or a uh, person, a slave freed from them. From okay. the so Umar was surprised. He said, you have appointed a mawla on Mecca. So the governor replied, he said, Oh Umar, he memorizes the Quran. And he knows the distribution of inheritance. Mm. So what was the reply of Umar? He said, I heard the messenger, peace be upon him, saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises the status of some people with this Quran and degrades others with it. So he accepted that. What? Why? Because of piety. Okay. He was assigned to this high position regardless of his color or race. Okay. Thank you very much. Sheikh Muhammad, um, we've talked about racism now. And I want to move over to a different topic, which is a topic I think, especially in the West, people discuss all the time. And that's the equality between the man and the woman. Can I ask you to begin this topic and just to shed some light on this, please? Sure. The Quran actually addresses this matter in Surah Al Nahl. Allah the Almighty says, Man amila salihan min dhakarin aw unsa, wa huwa mu'minun, fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibatan. Okay. Which means, whosoever does good deeds, whether a male or a female, it makes no difference, whether a male or a female. While in a state of belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises the same reward to both of them. No distinction based on gender. Okay. No discrimination. <laughs> and that's why, Umu Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, one of the great mothers of the believers, once said to the Prophet وسلم, how come that were not being mentioned in the Quran specifically? In the Quran, in the grammar, in the Arabic grammar, there is masculine and feminine. Right. Okay, in singular, in dual, in plural. Right. But whenever the term is mentioned in the masculine form, it covers both masculine and feminine. Like when Allah says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, all you who believe, inna alladheena amanu wa amilu salihati, those who believed and did good deeds, it covers both men and women, believing men and women, right? She said, how come we're not mentioned specifically? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to the wish of Ummu Salama, and he revealed, she said, walam ara'a illa, 
she just entered her room and there she heard the Prophet وسلم, claim the member to recite the ayat he just received. Surah Al Ahzab. In al Muslimin wa al Muslimat, wa al Mu'minin wa al Mu'minat. Indeed, the believing men and women, Muslims, men and women, the fasting, men and women, charitable, men and women, patient, men and women, and so on. Those who remember Allah much, men and women, are equivalent in their world. So we have several ayat in, in this regard. Basically, even in, in, in our worship, here we're here in Hajj, okay. we do the same. Except there are some physiological differences that must be kept in consideration, right? The kind of uh, dress that a woman wears in ihram to maintain her modesty. But for men, you're wearing this outfit which resembles the coffin, right. which also resembles the way that you were received in this life. But for women, they wear the proper uh, ihram. But to do all the manasik together, Tawaf, the same Sa'i, the same Mina, Arafah, throwing the stones. If a woman is exempt because of the crowd, she must assign somebody to throw the stones in her state. Right. Similarly, if an elder or a man who's handicapped cannot go by himself to throw the stones, somebody, the prayer is the same, the fasting is the same, and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses both men and women, and their word is definitely equivalent. There is no distinction, no difference whatsoever. Okay, uh, Dr. Muhammad, I'm going to bring up some controversial points that are commonly raised in the West. I'm afraid of your <laughs> controversial issues. <laughs> I have to make the <laughs> I have to make the program more interesting. So, uh, the question basically is this: In the West, many people will say that okay, you claiming that men and women are equal, but when we look at the issue of the shahada of giving witness. It's not the same. Uh, what is the distinction between the two here? But sorry, before you, before you answer, I've been... Uh, Brother Mohammed from Saudi Arabia, we've got a phone call. You're on the hook. This is a way. <laughs> Brother Mohammed, Assalamu alaikum. How are you, sir? Alaikum salam, brother. Uh, I have a few questions. Yes, brother, present us with your question or your feedback, please. Yeah, sure. The first question is, um, I'd like to fast tomorrow, inshallah, the day of Arafah, and I'd like to dedicate it to my beloved father and mother. Um, can I do so? Uh, my second question is, uh, my grandmother passed away uh, a couple of months ago, and an autopsy has been carried out uh, just to find out the cause of death. Uh, so my question here is, can, can uh, a dead person feel uh, what, what's going on um, after the person dies? Well, khair. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Muhammad. It will come. He's got two questions there, inshallah. Alaikum as We will come to both his questions in just a moment. Okay, Sheikh. <laughs> so you're not forgetting? <laughs> no, did, you, did you get the questions? <laughs> Sheikh Ismail, if I could ask you to elaborate on that principle, please. Bismillah rahman rahim In fact, in Islam, there is a difference between identicality and uh, what you can call equality. Because Islam recognizes equality between male and female in different aspects. For example, in terms of punishment and reward, okay. uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set equality between them, between male and female. Number two, in the participation and in the righteous deeds, that they can do. Number three, also in the punishment on crimes that may be inflicted on both parties. There are, okay. and also in responsibility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and responsibility in front of the community. These are the types of equality. But at the same time, there is a recognition of the different and various parts of male and female. The female represents a complementary part of the male and the male plays a complementary part for the rule in this life. Okay. That's why the Prophet ﷺ set up the equilibrium or the balance in his saying, الرجال, In the sense, the word شقائق, it's like counterparts. Okay. They are equal to each other. And in terms of duties and obligations, 
the Quran said, uh, uh, in, in setting that equality even in duties, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, uh, مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ بَرَجَةِ The sense is that both men have mutual, male and female, they have mutual uh, reciprocal uh, rights on each other. But men has a grade. And that grade may be interpreted by, uh, misinterpreted by others that it is a privilege. It's an honor which is given to men over women. But it is actually a responsibility that Islam has set this responsibility in the financial uh, burden which is laid on the man woman doesn't have to work the woman doesn't have to uh, provide the livelihood of the uh, of the husband or of her family but this is a responsibility of man okay. and there are a lot of other responsibilities which are not actually shared by men so there there are other uh, rules which are played by women which are not actually uh, made by men. Okay, Sheikh, we actually have another phone call from Saudi Arabia. Uh, Ghulamuddin from Saudi Arabia, yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Jameed, how are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. Uh, my greetings to all, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Muhammad Salah. He gives his greetings to you all. And I am working uh, this Huda uh, for the last 10 years. Okay, brother. Uh, and uh, especially I like this Ask Huda program and Huda is doing a commendable job. Okay. Uh, now my question to uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Salah is, Sheikh Muhammad Salah is, those uh, persons who are going Hajj without the permission, the three. Those who are doing Hajj? Without the permission, the three, from the government of, without the three, without, without the permission, permission. Uh, proper permission from the government of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, what is the opinion in that case? They are doing the Hajj without the permission. They are not registered in, in, in there. Okay. Okay, another thing. The another uh, aspect is that, but uh, the Kafla, the, uh, the Kafla who are charging us money, they are charging money around 9,000, 7,000, and this is also too much. We cannot afford it even also. Okay. So what is the opinion if the person goes without a permission from the government? Uh, we are going uh, without a permission to them, uh, make the Hajj. What is the opinion of the Isla Islamic viewpoint on that? Okay, brother, I think your questions become more clear now. Thank you very much, inshallah. I'll present that to, to Muhammad Salah in just a moment. Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, in, in terms of, uh, I would like actually to be short, in, in, in terms of inheritance, actually, Islam, if, if you'd like to read any text of the Quran, you have to read the surrounding environment in which that text was revealed or the occasion and the society a society which used actually to inherit women women used to be inherited like a merchandise so when the quran came and entitled her an independent financial responsibility and giving her a definite share of inheritance this is a great achievement that islam has uh, it made it made it made a big a big stride in the history of humanity, and okay. this was actually common in most of all, all all cultures. But if you delve into understanding the basic shares and the laws of inheritance, you will find that woman is not actually uh, un unjustly treated or half of a man. This is only in one case, uh, in, in 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 the case of. Uh, what is commonly known as the asaba and asaba means that when um, a remaining part in, 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 in sharia or inheritance there are two basic uh, ways of distributing inheritance there are some people who are in, entitled definite shares like quarter of the estate or half or uh, one third or two thirds etc uh, and other people who are entitled remaining part of the estate of the deceased Okay. If you calculate that, you will find that women, like the daughter, the uh, uh, the uh, wife, the mother, etc., they are entitled more of the definite shares. So if you calculate it, you will find that Islam gave a preference even as a priority for a woman to be given her due right specifically and decided. And also Islam cared about the financial responsibility of a man, 
and women doesn't have this it's such a financial responsibility this is the reason that it made a variance in the shares of inheritance okay we've actually got another phone call uh, abu sufyan from canada Safwan, Safwan. abu Safwan, you're in canada already wow mashallah okay yes brother could you present us your question please Pardon? could you print, present us your question or your comment please yeah, I'm, 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 Go ahead, Abbas Safan, we hear you. Continue, brother. Hello? Okay, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Brother, if I could ask you please to listen to us over the phone and not pay attention to the television, that's what's causing this delay. Yes, brother? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Salah, assalamu alaikum. My name is Abbas Safan. Okay. I'm calling from Canada. Uh, my question is, it's nothing to do with the money, uh, because there is not proper arrangement for Qurbani in Canada. I send my money to India and Pakistan for okay. slaughter. Okay. So my question is, because uh, there, you know, that they have been delayed uh, you know, in the heat in Lada and the uh, Arafa, two days from Saudi Arabia. So what is the uh, regarding this uh, removing hairs on the nail? This is my question because uh, we follow the Saudi Arabia here in uh, Calgary. So we are doing on the obviously on Saturday, but there it is on uh, Monday. Oh okay. My, so my second question is regarding what we talk a lot about. Okay, I got, I got it the has question. no discrimination. It has all kind of. Okay, brother. Uh, brother. You know, Thank you very much. Your yeah. question is your question is very no, clear, inshallah. He's got another one. Okay, go on then. Hello? You can have two okay. today. Uh, because though we have a lot of, you know, about uh, we talk about this, there's no discrimination and in the eyes of Allah, there's in Akramakum, in the Layat Kakum. Why we do not have built this character in, 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 in the people? Because, you know, the moment you landed on the airport and that, um, uh, you know, you realize this uh, when you go for help. You realize there is a discrimination, you see. So why don't people understand that we are coming there for help and why don't they train their people to, uh, to treat them? They are the Zuyu for Rahman, they say. Why there is a difference in treatment for the people coming from Bangladesh, Pakistan and India? This is my question. This is really because people talk a lot about it. In a, in a different tone. So these are my two questions. Thank you. Jazakallah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate your questions and inshallah I'll present them to the relevant speakers, inshallah. Okay, we've got a... We've you, got, didn't, you didn't answer any question. We've got quite a few <laughs> questions here. Sheikh, if I can uh, begin with yourself. We had two questions right at the beginning and to be honest, with you, it was a bit unclear. Uh, did you pick up... Yes, the first question of the brother who called from here, he said... Uh, is it permissible to perform Hajj without the permit? Right. He was talking about the cost and so on, and he doesn't have a permit. Is it permissible? Right. And we have to um, differentiate between whether Hajj is valid or not, and the issue of the permit. When the local authorities regulate the process of Hajj and issues a permit, this is for the welfare of everybody, those who are performing Hajj and those who are not performing Hajj. Because as far as I know this year, we have 2.5 million. This is the official statement. Okay. Which means the actual statement <laughs> will be up to 3, 4 million people. Mm. Okay. And you see there is a, a process of construction and remodeling and so on. So that leads to a lot of obstacles for the proper number to perform Hajj. Especially okay. in Tawaf and Sa'ah. Tawaf al ifada and the sa'i for Hajj, and also Tawaf al wada So if the person broke the rules, he's in violation of the rules. Right. What if he made it and he managed to perform Hajj? If he fulfilled the pillars of Hajj and have done it properly, Hajj is valid. In a sense, if this is his first Hajj, Hajj al Islam is fulfilled. The fifth pillar of the deen is waived. Okay. So we have to differentiate. When somebody says a woman was young, doesn't have a mahram, and she came all the way from the States, to perform Hajj. She twisted the rules, she did whatever. She made a disobedience of traveling without a mahram. But is Hajj valid? Hajj is valid. 
Has she fulfilled the fifth pillar? Yes, she did fulfill the fifth pillar. Okay. But she's in violation of that particular prohibition or restriction. Okay. That is the first question of the That's the first question. Uh, th this last question I would like to address that to uh, uh, Sheikh Safi. When uh, they, the brother was talking about uh, the differentiation factor between people being taqwa, but uh, he said that in Hajj he doesn't see that and people don't treat each, each other fairly. Uh, what can we respond to that? We need to differentiate in this case between what has been revealed by Allah SWT in Quran and what has been conveyed by Prophet This is the idea. If we have some individual you know, uh, practices which violates the teachings of Allah SWT and Prophet this is the problem of the persons, the individual and themselves. We cannot blame Islam for, for, the, for the such you know, you know, misconduct. <coughs> so it's something, something, something individual. Uh, you know, it, it, it refers to the person himself. We cannot okay. attach it to Islam. Okay. So we need to differentiate between two things. What the, the, the uh, Islam denounces discrimination based on race or color, but we might have, yes, some people who violate these teachings, so they are sinful in this case because of their violation. Okay. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, We've had this question over the last few days so many times, so if I could ask you to just keep it to the responses, to keep it brief. Uh, the brother's asking about Qurbani, the sacrifice, and he's upset because the Eid in certain countries has fallen two days later than the Eid in uh, here. Uh, and he's concerned about his Qurbani. What does he do and where does he send it? Is it okay to send it abroad? Could I just ask you to just elaborate on his question, please? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I think we answered this question before. Um, uh, briefly, we can say that uh, uh, making an udhiya, or a qurbani sacrifice in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a person's residence is actually preferred, since it is actually he is serving his community or his family. Uh, if he is actually would like to donate uh, some part of it, and also recognizing the sunnah of the Prophet sallam, of doing it by himself. Uh, and enjoying as according to the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that whoever attends the sacrificial, uh, the, the slaughtering of the sacrificial animal, that every single hair of it will be uh, actually reckoned as a righteous good deed uh, for him. Uh, but in case of the difference among some countries with regard to the sighting of the crescent, uh, this is a recognized opinion of the majority of scholars. Some scholars actually recognize that each country has his own uh, sighting of the moon and it is uh, applicable in Islamic uh, fiqh or Islam, Islamic law and there is no problem. Yet the ideal and the preferred view among all scholars is that and that what we hope that all Muslims uh, are united and they celebrate Eid at the same time. But if a person is residing in a country uh, the Eid or the celebration will be actually according to the community that he lives in. Okay. According to the authentic hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that he considered Eid to be the day when the community, all the community celebrated. For the occasion of this brother, if it is even delayed, as you know that there is a lapse, uh, there is a considerable time for Udhiyah, which extends from the 10th of Dhul Hijjah all the way to the 13th of the Hijjah, so even if he slaughters the animal in any of the uh, of that, he may actually uh, uh, he may uh, catch up a date or a time which is compatible with his own celebration and also the country where he is going to sacrifice. Okay, thank you very much for that response, dear viewers. We've come to the end of the first part, so please stay tuned. Don't go too far away and join us for the second part in just a few moments. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Imagine that the Anbiya They were the ones, they were the most beloved to Allah And they had the hardest lives He assumed that he had some kind of superiority And he was a better, more chosen 
you know, a select better person because he had this wealth. And then you look at all the other people who had wealth, and some of them were the worst people. They had Fir'aun, Fir'aun, and Qarun. You're reviving your niyyah time and again, time and again, uh, that you're doing insincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of the youth, they think, oh, I'm going to pray when I'm old, it's okay, now I'll have fun, have fun in my life. Later on, I'll work, I'll go on my bed, I'll pray five times a day. And all these things, they think that that's later on in their life, and they don't know when, when. When they will die. Amira, who's your role model? Khadija radiallahu And why? Because she was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uh, wife, and she was the first lady to believe in Islam. <laughs> Huda TV's social media sites are the best way to contact us from anywhere around the world. Stay connected with Huda TV's latest news and programs through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Skype, and Instagram. It's fast and easy. Stay up to date with your favorite shows and scholars today. Huda TV. A light in every home. La bayk Allahumma la bayk. La bayk Allahumma la bayk. La bayk la sharika la kala bayk. Inna alhamda wa nihmata la kala. Why is Hajj so important? Allah the Almighty said in verse number 97 of uh, the third chapter of the Quran, which is known as Ali Imran. He said, Wa lillahi ala nasi. Follow up, performing Hajj, after Hajj, and Umrah after Umrah. So what is the first step? Ihram. The first pillar is Ihram. What does Ihram mean? What does it entail? Hajj al-Ifrad, many of the local people do Hajj al-Ifrad and others because they're exempt from offering the Hajj or the sacrifice. It doesn't require Hajj. So when you say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً وَحَجَّ That's called Qiran. And you do the rites of Umrah and you do not take off the Ihram condition. Rather you continue until you finish the Hajj. So Al-Hajj and Al-Umrah and following up. Uh, between Hajj and Umrah for those who can afford it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their past sins or whatever sins in, in between. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back after a very short break. Join me and the guest here today. Uh, I would like to address a particular question about equality and hajj. Sheikh Muhammad, how is equality manifested in hajj? It's manifested in every footstep you take in hajj. In the rainbow color you see, people are forming this amazing rainbow color. In tawaf, in sa'i and throwing the stones and going to Mina, coming from Arafah to Muzdalifah. And the greatest demonstration of equality is in Muzdalifah. I'm performing Hajj with a group of businessmen and doctors, big time, okay. um, powerful people in their communities in America. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. And today I was addressing them that without your ID, no one recognizes who's a doctor and who's a nurse. Who's the doctor and who's the patient? <laughs> True. Males can be nurses as well. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, there are male nurses, of course. Right. So what I mean is, when you dress up in, in this very simple uniform, an izar, an arida, everybody automatically becomes equal. Right. Equal in, in, the, in the treatment, how we treat each other. And subhanAllah, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warns a person who may have or maintains an atom weight of kibr, of arrogance in his heart, shall not enter paradise. And this warning becomes even emphasized, much more emphasized in a place like that. You should really humble yourself and think that others are better than you. 
You treat others the same way that you like to be treated. Shoulder to shoulder. Once the iqama is called, do you choose whom to stay next to? Do you choose the person? Do you choose, the, the, do you choose their ethnicity, their height, their complexion? Sheikh, could I ask you just to hold your thought because okay. there's, there's a phone call that's come through. Uh, Sister Asma from Canada. Yes, yes Sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, how are you? Uh, how are you, everybody? Yes, sister. Hello? Hello? Uh, I have two questions. Is sister, present your question, please. Okay. One question is that, that uh, uh, we are uh, sorting our um, like, uh, code or whatever in Pakistan. But the uh, uh, Eve is on uh, Monday. And we are celebrating some on Sunday. So what will happen that uh, uh, when we should cut our nail and hair on Monday or on Saturday? Because we are celebrating on Saturday. One question. And the other question is that uh, obviously Eve is on Saturday and Yom Alpha is on Friday. So what will happen if people are celebrating in Pakistan? So when they can have their fasting uh, on, because Alpha is on Friday. So these are my two questions. Uh, okay, Thank sister. You. Okay, thank you very much, sister. Your question is is clear. Inshallah, we will answer that question very soon. Sorry, Sheikh. So as I said, this equality is presented from the moment you say labbaik Allahumma labbaik. There is no specific chantation or invocation for rich people, different than the poor. No a specific supplication for Arab, different than the Arab. SubhanAllah. Allah made it so simple and communal in praising Him. Whether you're very eloquent or an illiterate man, everybody praises Allah saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The same for man. In Hajj, when you start the talbiyah, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. There is no easy pass for certain people to commence into the act of Hajj, different than others based on their wealth. You know, you may have different accommodations and that is perfectly fine. Right. Based on your affordability. What we're talking about, there are certain areas where no matter how much wealth you possess, okay. how much power you possess, it would not make you any different or any distinct than others. Look at Muzdalifa. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You know, people are staying in five-star hotels, eating the best kind of food, changing the, the lining of their beds on a daily basis in, in the hotels. But when we go to Muzdalifa, everybody spreads the floor. And we have countless stars. <laughs> when you lie down on your back, and you look at the heaven and there's not five stars, actual stars, countless stars. Real stars. Real stars. Yeah. And the greatest demonstration of equality is in the goal of each and every one of us. If the king of whatever country is performing Hajj, why performing Hajj? What is his goal? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, Man hajja falam yarfus wa lam yafsuk, raja'a ka yawmi wa ladathu ummu. You want all your sins to be forgiven, right? And that is the same goal of your servant, of your maid. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established those meanings in his farewell speech here. I mean with here, it was in Arafah. Then he also gave another speech on the Eid day. He said, indeed, all of you belong to Adam. And Adam is from Turab, from dust. That is our origin. There is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, nor for a non-Arab over an Arab, nor for a white over a black, vice versa, except through piety and righteousness. Okay. That is the actual presentation of equality. Look at Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. I love this companion. May Allah be pleased with him. Subhanallah. It's very important and beautiful to study the seerah and the life of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, while he was invited to receive the keys of Jerusalem. Now, in, in, in the terms of, you know, war strategy, he's the greatest, the greatest emperor. 
He's Amir al Mu'mineen, according to what we call him. And he was traveling from Medina on the back of a mule or a donkey. Okay. Along with his servant. They take turns. Upon entering Jerusalem, the sacred city, <laughs> that it was his servant's turn to ride and he walks. So the servant said, Yeah, Amir al Mu'mineen, please. You know, people have to see you riding and I'm walking. He said, no, it's your turn. Stay there. Stay there. <laughs> then while he was walking, they went through a muddy area and he walked in the mud. <laughs> what did he <laughs> say? <laughs> he said, we used to be the most disgraced ummah, humiliated nation. No way. Nobody recognizes us. Allah gave us honor and dignity. He dignified us through Islam. So if we ever see dignity and honor in anything other than Islam, Islam the practice, not just the theory, Yes. Islam the practice, then Allah will humiliate us again. Okay. And I think uh, I need to add something to this point. Please. Is this is what attracted the people uh, in the other cultures because it was a revolutionary and dynamic change in the history of manners and behavior. Especially when the Prophet ﷺ sent as messengers to those kings and rulers. Those who were serving those rulers and kings recognized the equality that Islam uh, spreads among the kings and the subjects, among all people. That's why they were the first people to ask for salvation from all those, uh, for, for, from all those types of slavery that they were subjected to in the uh, Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. Okay. The way the Sahaba talked to those kings and rulers and the confidence they had and the way they presented Islam, uh, this what attracted most of the nations to the great contributions that that great religion introduced. I have a surprise for you. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the first time I revealed this on the screen. I know of a CIA officer Okay. A higher ranking officer. SubhanAllah. Yes, he visited a military post in one of the Muslim countries for some intelligence coordination and so on. And that was during Ramadan. So it coincided the Azan time. So a regular soldier called the Azan. Then when he called the Iqama, the commander of the unit, the generals, the corners, all of them lined up and they introduced an ordinary soldier to lead them in the prayer. Mm. It was Maghrib time. This guy was going out of his mind. What is going on? He recognizes this as the general. And this is as a guard. How come he's leading these guys? He's leading them because he knows more Quran than them. Yeah, this guy is carrying a lot of francs. But this person is leading him in the prayer because he's superior in this area. Then it was iftar time. They shared the dates and they all sat around in the food. And they started eating. The commander and the soldiers. All of them, the drivers and the guards and everybody. It clicked in his mind. It tackled his heart. What is going on here? And this is a guy who has a mission. This mission was completely on the contrary of what he ended up with, where he actually ended up accepting Islam. No. That happens repeatedly, and I personally know many people in the States, um, former uh, Marines particularly, okay. when they come to visit the community, the Muslim community, and they see the rich and the poor, the millionaire and his driver, everybody is lining up in the prayer and eating together. And this is Islam. Other than that, yes, indeed, actions speak louder than words. And that's why we are ordered to have our actions in line with what we preach, for otherwise that is condemned and criticized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. I want to bring in uh, Sheikh Shafi here. The Church of Hudaybiyah, there is an element of uh, equality inside of this treaty. Can I ask you to expand on this, please? Okay, it's a long story, <laughs> but you need to have it start with it from the beginning. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he, he saw a dream, and we know that the dreams of the, the, the messengers are true visions, one, one form of revelation, that he was performing 
طواف around the Kaaba with his companions. The companions were delighted with this with this dream. So he peace upon him, you know, decided to march peacefully okay. to Mecca to perform Umrah in the sixth year. When they reached the, ba the boundaries of Mecca, uh, they were prevented from entering Mecca and completing the rituals of Umrah. And uh, uh, after negotiations and talks, he sent an ambassador, Uthman, as an ambassador, and they, sent, they ended up with a treaty. This a treaty, which is called the Hudaybiyah, in which the Prophet, <coughs> peace be upon him, agreed on certain con uh, conditions. The first of which was that he would return back to Medina without performing, without performing Umrah, okay. and he will delay it to the coming year, and only will remain only for three days. And one of the conditions is that they will have truce for 10 years. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, signed that uh, treaty with the Meccans, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were, were overwhelmed with sorrow and regret. Okay. Because they were longing to perform, to enter Mecca and to perform that Umrah to the extent that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he ordered them, to end their ihram twice and thrice, none of them moved. None of them. Okay. So he, peace be upon him, was upset and he got angry. He returned back to his tent and he explained the matter to his wife, Um Salama. Okay. She said to him, just go directly without speaking to them, slaughter your sacrificial animals, hadi, and shave your hair. Something practical. Okay. So he, peace be upon him, went, slaughtered his head, shaved his hair, and all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they did the same. Later, after years, it appeared to the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, the wisdom of Allah SWT for that treaty, in which Allah SWT has called it as a clear victory. What is noticeable here is that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, took the consultation of his wife, Um Salama, and he applied it in a very critical matter. And it was, you know, applicable. Okay. It solved a problem or that, was, that Prophet وسلم, encountered, and the treaty was signed uh, by Prophet وسلم, and all this, you know, the matter was settled. Okay. So he said, we, whenever we can have a sound consultation, regardless man or woman, and it proves to be the right choice, we accept it. Okay. Sheikh, I want to ask you just to pause just for a second. Yes. Uh, we've actually got uh, Brother Bashir from Saudi Arabia. Yes, brother. Yes. Uh, my question to the panel is, uh, the Yom Arfa will be tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, it is a day of fasting as well as Sunnah of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So, we, I want to ask a question because there will be a day different compared to India back home. Right, okay. So, the day of Alpha will fall a day after. Okay. That's fine. So the day of Arafah, they should observe for fasting. Okay, brother, I've got your question. Inshallah, we'll, we'll answer your question, Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much for your call. So, Sheikh, if I could ask you just to finish off, please. Okay, <laughs> I have just finished <laughs> with the covering. The, <laughs> okay. So, uh, we do not, we have equality. We do not dis differentiate regarding consultations or advice, whether from men or from male or female. Okay. Yes. Thank you and this much. was practiced by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi on more than one occasion. Exactly. And this is one example, yes. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad, we've had this question come up again and again, and the viewers are really concerned about this and really confused about this as well, is the fact that there is a, a difference of Eid, and at the same time they're fasting on a Friday. Like, what do they do? Because the, the Arafat falls on a Friday. So those who want to do Hajj, what should they do? Should they fast? 
or should they accompany this with a Thursday or a Saturday? What should they do? Those who are not performing Hajj are highly, highly recommended to fast. Due to the Hadith, sound Hadith in which Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, fasting on the day of Arafah expiates the sins of the past year and a year in advance, the year to come. So this is an opportunity that it should not be wasted. Whenever Arafah falls on Friday, normally it is not permissible to single out Friday with any voluntary fasting, except okay. if it is a habitual fasting. For instance, you have people who fast every other day, right? And they fast every other day, they say they fast Thursday and they skip Friday. Next week, they will have to skip Thursday and fast on Friday. So that is permissible. Why? Because the sequence. That's called habitual fasting. They're not singling out deliberately Friday with fasting or for fasting. Because Friday is a Eid day. Okay. Okay, that is the wisdom behind or the effective reason. Why don't we fast uh, voluntary fasting? It's not permissible to fast on the Eid day. So if there is a reason, a specific reason, such as the day of Ashura and the day of Arafah, then it is permissible to single out Friday for fasting. You're fasting for a reason, not just for the sake of fasting on Friday. Okay. Okay? Okay. Uh, Sheikh Mahmoud, if I can build on that, because there was a comment that was given to us before as well. Uh, so Arafah falls on a Friday, and uh, those who are performing Hajj, do they still have to pray the Friday prayer? Oh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, actually, this uh, happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the only time that he performed Hajj, uh, uh, where he performed uh, Arafah was on Friday. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's practice that he combined both Zuhr and Asr. And he made the sermon for the Arafah, the normal sermon for Arafah. So the Messenger وسلم, offered Zuhr and it was not audible in the sense that uh, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed it as shortened. Uh, so it became the Sunnah or the practice of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that for the pilgrims, if the day of Arafah is on Friday, it is not, uh, it is not offered and it is Zuhr is offered in Islam. And it falls actually within the basic principle of Friday that it is obligatory on people who are residents. And most of the pilgrims actually they are not resident in Arafah okay. in itself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. Okay. Uh, Sheikh Shafi, uh, I want to build up on a principle that was discussed before the, the Sheikh was mentioning about the doctors and uh, the lawyers and so forth, the rich people. Uh, I want to know how else does uh, Hajj manifest itself or show it, show us that there is no difference between the rich and the poor. Mashallah, this aspect has been a lot of elaborated. Mashallah, thoroughly by the Sheikh. Uh, what can we add? Just the point that uh, it's not only in Hajj, in all, in, as the Sheikh said, in all the pillars and aspects, acts of worship or rituals, the supplies they are equal, doing the same acts of worship, rituals, with no discrimination except with things which were specified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger So as the Sheikh said, they are doing the same rituals, acts of worship in Mina, in Arafah, in Muzdalifa, with no discrimination or differences or preference for any of our others. And this applies to other, you know, pillars of Islam. For example, the prayer, as the Sheikh said. And this, I have, I have worked as an interpreter after my graduation. Okay. Uh, and they noticed that. I was interpreter with the National Guard whenever they enter the, the masjid all these ranks different you know different you know we had, they have different ranks and treatment all these discrimination dissolve whenever they enter the masjid so the first row of the masjid is not booked for the VIPs or for the high rank so okay. might this, you might find the privates or the just the guards and it, uh, the imam could be just a guard because he memorized the Quran and he will lead the salah with him. All the acts of worship, fasting, the king, the, the, the ministers, the, 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 uh, the, dust, the dust man, the common, they are doing the same. Fasting from dawn 
until sunset and refraining from the same aspects and this applies to Hajj so this all this shows the, the equality uh, uh, of Islam regarding all acts of worship with no discriminations whatsoever and subhanAllah not something even not not even regarding that uh, even even things related to, to, to uh, you know something I noticed that even even Muslims they are treated equally even after their death. Okay. For example, if you enter a, a, a graveyard for Muslims, you will not differentiate between the graves of kings or just common people. For example, if you go to Riyadh and they take you to the graveyard in the, in the, in the capital and as I ask you, where is the grave of King Abdul Aziz? Where is the grave of King Khalid? Where is the grave? I challenge you just to how how you will not be able to differentiate between them. You will have a heap of sand, or with two stones, they are the same. Once I was uh, several times I was abroad, I was in ta the taxi. Sometimes we passed by some graves, and they could notice that there is a difference. <laughs> there is discrimination even with the graves. Some graves are, you know, they have marbles that you know that it belongs to someone someone who is rich you know or death, he has a high status the has death cost on their life <laughs> yes <laughs> so even just that this is what's apparent what's inside the the, the graves of course it's not the same it depends the piety and the faith okay Allah knows best. okay thank you very much dear viewers we've come to the end of the second part we're going to take a short break but i want you to do something for me during this short break the day of Arafah is just around the corner. I want you to raise your hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a special dua. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts the hajj of all these millions of people that have come and sacrificed their wealth and their time and some of them even their lives maybe. So take these few minutes to make dua for us and for those who are making hajj and I'll see you in just a few moments. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka Imagine that the Anbiya, they were the ones, they were the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they had the hardest lives. He assumed that he had some kind of superiority and he was a better, more chosen, you know, a select, better person because he had this wealth. And then you look at all the other people who had wealth, and some of them were the worst people. They had Fir'aun, Fir'aun, and Qarun. Qa reviving your niyyah time and again, time and again, uh, that you're doing insincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of the youth, they think, oh, I'm going to pray when I'm old, it's okay, now I'll have fun, have fun in my life. They turn, I'll work, I'll go my bed, I'll pray five times a day. And all these things, they think that that's late on in their life, and they don't know when, when. When they will die. I Amir, mean, who's your role model? Khadija radiallahu And why? Because she was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's uh, wife, and she was the first lady to believe in Islam. <laughs> Huda TV's social media sites are the best way to contact us from anywhere around the world. Stay connected with Huda TV's latest news and programs through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Skype, and Instagram. It's fast and easy. Stay up to date with your favorite shows and scholars today. Huda TV. A light in every home. La bake Allahumma la bake. La bake Allahumma la bake. La bake la sharika la ka la bake. La sharika la ka la bake. Inna alhamda wa niqamata la ka. Why is Hajj so important? Allah the Almighty said in verse number 97 of uh, the third chapter of the Quran, which is known as Ali Imran. He said, Wa lillahi ala nasi. حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا تابع بين الحج والعمرة فإنهما ينفيان الفقر والذنوب. Follow up performing Hajj after Hajj and Umrah after Umrah. So what is the first step? Ihram. The first pillar is Ihram. What does Ihram? What does it mean? 
Hajj al Ifrad, many of the local people do Hajj al Ifrad, and others because they're exempt from offering the Hajj or the sacrifice. It doesn't require Hajj. So when you say, Labbaik Allahumma Umratan wa Hajja, that's called Qiran. And you do the rites of Umrah, and you do not take off the Ihram condition. Rather, you continue until you finish the Hajj. So Al Hajj and Al Umrah and following up. Uh, between Hajj and Umrah for those who can afford it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their past sins or whatever sins in, in between. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back after a short break. I'm sure you fulfilled our promise and you made dua for all those people behind me and for us here in the studio as well. Uh, unfortunately, one of our guests had to leave because it's very late in the evening and people have many things to do. Tomorrow is the day of Arafah, so he has been excused, inshallah. Uh, but uh, I'd like to direct my next question to Sheikh Shafi. Uh, Sheikh Safi, is there in Islam equality between the adults and the children? Uh, this reminds me of the question that was addressed to Dr. Muhammad regarding the uh, distribution of inheritance, which was stressed by Prophet Sallam in the Sermon of Arafah when he, when he said that La wasiyyata li warith There is no will for someone who for heirs who has short even, even during, even before death parents are encouraged to treat their children equally okay. without any discrimination. One of the companions of Prophet Muhammad his name is Nu'man ibn Bashir, he said that my mother asked my father to present me a gift out of his property. So he said my father uh, uh, gave me that gift after some hesitation and my mother insisted that I should, he should go to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and make him as a witness on that gift. He said, he, my father took me by hand and he brought me to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And he told him the story that I have given my son a gift of my wealth. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu asked him, do you have other sons? He said, yes. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu I will not be a witness on injustice. In other narrations, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu asked him, do you wish that they will give you the same, the equal kindness and care? He said, okay. yes. So he said, then treat them equally or give them all. So this shows that even, even with children, we should treat them equally without any differentiation, whether boys or daughters unfortunately unfortunately some might you know give some reference to the boys as gifts also no this is forbidden from giving them any preference based on their you know gender uh, treated equally whether boys or girls during their life okay. the guests should be equal after death of course the shores of boys and sons and daughters are you know, different as revealed uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have many stories of parents who didn't treat their children equally and they ended up with some of their children who, you know, were indifferent about, about them when they get old. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help parents to treat their children equally Ameen. with fairness, Ameen. inshallah ta'ala. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad, it's always good to talk about stories as they increase our Iman and increase our morale, especially in these days when we need it. Uh, I want to ask you to elaborate on a particular story which I think is really beautiful. The story of the son of Umar, Umar ibn al-As and Umar radiallahu ta'ala Yeah, Umar ibn al-As. Umar ibn al-As, sorry. Yes. And, uh, his son and uh, Umar. Uh, Junaid, I want to inform you something which is very important. Okay. Uh, justice and equity and equality in Islam was a basic a principle which uh, penetrated all the practices of Muslims, especially in the first generation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions. So it is, uh, it is not, it is only extraordinary 
to find pitfalls in that respect because the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam embedded in their hearts the way to be equal even if the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam when a disbeliever wanted to enter the masjid he didn't distinguish himself the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't wear special clothes the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't uh, actually um, uh, sit on a throne or an, in, in a lofty place uh, he did not actually wear different clothes than his uh, companions so whenever any person entered the masjid he would ask who is muhammad what is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is the best of humans but he still sits on the floor eats simple food and he sometimes jokes with his companions walks with them when he if it is humility it is humbleness it is showing equality with his uh, companions that's why the sahaba assimilated and absorbed those examples of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and translated them into action and when they traveled to different territories of the world it, they spread that justice this type of qualities especially as you remember when amr ibn al-as he had a son and amr ibn al-as was the ruler of egypt okay and he had a son who raced uh, used racing in horses was one of the laymen so that person or that young man competed with the son of the emir or the son of the king and he actually raced and he won won the race okay so the the, the other young man became very upset and he started hitting him and he said you compete with the son of the dignified people so when that young man the egyptian returned back to his father his father realized that there is an emir a caliph that the people that his talks and walks are spread everywhere in the territories okay and he was very well known that he is a just ruler his name is Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. So he ran away to Medina, he took preparation and went there, and he told him the story. And Umar ibn al-Khattab waited until he called for Am, coming from, from Egypt, him and his son. And in front of all people, when the son admitted that he did that, he said, come on, and hit the son of the dignified on his head as he hit you. Okay. And moreover, he said, and hit Am, because he is the Amir and he is the ruler who gave him that opportunity. You know, Junaid, from where did it come? It come from our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he was standing in his in his masjid one day, and he was adjusting the Sahaba, disciplining them in the room, in the row, in prayer, and then he was using siwak. So he hit one of his companions with the siwa and he said, straighten, straighten in the line. So the Sahabi said, you hit me, O Messenger of Allah. What did the Messenger Sallallahu said? The best man, the best man and the most beloved one. What did he say? He simply uncovered his clothes and he showed his tunic, his belly to the man. His name is Sawad. He said, take revenge take retaliation hit me and he said yes I wanna and he jumped onto the belly of the messenger وسلم, and he started kissing it this is justice this is a type of equality that the Prophet وسلم, practiced and the Sahaba spread everywhere and uh, yes the, st the story of Dr. Muhammad regarding the our beloved Muhammad peace be upon him he's our our model peace be upon him as Allah says فقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسرة الحسنة truly you have a good model of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم to follow how how equal he treated his his companions with the same kindness with the same attention right to the extent that each one of the companions thought that he's the most beloved person to the to the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم including Amr ibn Al-As he once asked him he thought that he observed the kindness and the attention the care of Prophet Muhammad was paying him he said O Messenger of Allah who is the most beloved person to you he thought that he was he will say you he said Abu Bakr then he said who's next he said Umar 
Then he said, who's next? He said, Uthman. And then he said, I boast. <laughs> so that, then, peace be upon Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Regardless of the rank of the society, the tribe, it was reported that in his masjid, there was a black or black man or woman who used to live at the back in a hush or something like a tent, small tent, in the back of his masjid, and she used to collect the trash okay. in the masjid. One day, Prophet missed that lady, and he asked his companions, where is she? They said that she died last night, and we didn't wish to bother you. He said, why haven't you wake me up? Show me her grave. Okay. So she went, she went, he, وسلم, he went to her grave and he prayed on her. Even though she was just an old lady, he treated her equally as the rest of the companions. May Allah be pleased with him, with no discrimination, paying the same attention. So this is the best model that we should follow. Our of beloved Muhammad وسلم, of in all aspects. Of course. Thank yes. you very much. Okay. Brings me back to your turn, Chef. Uh, I want to now talk about the concept of submission. We looked at submission a few days ago, and I, I want to understand that uh, if we submit to Allah and submit to His orders, can we lead to equality? Will I be treated equally and receive equality? SubhanAllah, Junaid, it is the only one to whom all people should be directed. It is the one that we bow down to him, the one that we prostrate our own bodies and faces to him. And when we uh, reach that point of sub true submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see on the platforms here, mm -hmm. a lot of people that they are sitting, some of them they have health, and they have wealth, they have big positions, great positions, but they accepted that to respond to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those blessed valleys and places. They, it is just a submission to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For sure submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his order helps a Muslim to be equal to others. Okay. But everybody is competing to reach Allah first. That's why the scholar said, if you are able to be the first to reach Allah, you must do that. Okay. And running to Him. And this is the meaning of Fafirru in Allah. And as you vision all the acts of rituals and all the practices in Islam which are related to submitting, responding to Allah, all of them they, they achieve that principle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to emphasize that in our hearts and in our practices. That's why, brother, we really we suffer okay we really suffer a dichotomy or what we can call a difference between theory and practice right because we pray in the same row but once when we get out of the masjid everybody starts saying i i i am i am the one I'm, my father is such and such my position is such and such show me what you did show me no we are in when when you when, when you just finish any act of worship it doesn't, uh, we, we do not re realize the real meaning and the real objective of those types of, of ibadah. All people are equal in responding to the Messenger of Allah. Okay. All people are equal in responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All people are equal in responding to all the Quran and to the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and this is an example of how the Sahaba were very obedient to the Messenger, and all of them were equal in that meaning. When the Prophet ﷺ called Abu Abdullah ibn Mas'ud after the prayer of Fajr, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was actually has already left the Masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, "Sit down." What did he do? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not take steps back to the Masjid to sit in front of the Messenger. He sat down on the step of the masjid. The Prophet asked him why. And he said, because I want to respond to your call, to your order, O Messenger of Allah. Uh, I'm going to ask you just to pause just for a few moments because I've got a call. Uh, sister Sophia from Saudi Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum. 
Uh, unfortunately, the line disconnected. Sorry, Sheikh. If I can ask you to continue, please. Uh, so all of those, all of those meanings and practices, and force the meaning of submitting to the orders of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. All of the people are equal in front of law, as he said. It is exactly the same. All people are equal in front of the Sharia. Ah. There is no privilege of one over the other. If you look into the history of courts in Islam, okay, and how the judges treated people, for example, the story of Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he received, uh, when the, the Qadi, the judge received him, and he called him with the best name that he loves, and then his defendant or his uh, claimant or the other party of the, of the, of the, of the claim came, and the judge didn't call him, the same way or in the same manner and Ali ibn Abi Talib raised it and said you did not treat us justly that's why they used to treat the two people in the court they sit in the same way they, they are called in the same manner all of them are equal in Sharia also all people are free from liability okay. nobody could be accused of any crime without producing a, a proof and this is a simple a sample of uh, the equality that the Sharia ah has set set out. Innocent before proven guilty. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Be before even being guilty. When you look at the law of retaliation and punishments in Sharia, ah, equality is embedded in its ideal sense. Okay. If a person violates and sheds the blood of another person, that he may spend his life as an expense of violating and shedding that blood. Okay. Unfortunately, we do not admit and we do not understand all of those meanings in equality. Okay. If a person hits a finger or a tip of a finger of another, the other person, the hit person, has the right to do the same with the one who made it. Okay. So we have equality. That's why it's called Al-Qasas in the law of retaliation, equity. In every single aspect, if a person a person gouges the eyes of another person, he has a right to do it in the same way. You may ask me, where is mercy? But I can ask you, where is the mercy of the criminal in the first step? This is a way of deferring people, okay. not actually violating the rights of others. Okay. Because everybody is, all of them are equal in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got just under five minutes, uh, Sheikh. If I could ask you to give us a gentle reminder for a minute or two. Uh, tomorrow is the day of Arafah. Could you just give us a gentle reminder of the significance of this very heavy day, please? Exactly. Very good question. Okay. Day of Arafah. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Al Hajj Arafah." Okay. Hajj is Arafah. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in other hadith said. ما من يوم أكثر من أن يعتق الله فيه عبدا من النار من يوم عرفة. الله سبحانه وتعالى. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, there is no day in which Allah سبحانه وتعالى frees his slaves from the hellfire more than the day of عرفة. وما رؤي الشيطان أصغر ولا أحقر منه في يوم عرفة إلا يوم بدر. And the shaytan hasn't been seen as mean and humiliated as he has been seen in the day of Arafah except on the day of Badr when he saw the angels were descending from heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day descends in a manner that befits him to this worldly heaven and he praises his slaves who gathered here seeking her forgiveness and he asks his angels and he knows best why my slaves gathered here. The angels will reply they gathered God seeking your forgiveness. So Allah Subhanahu says, be the witnesses that I have forgiven, forgiven them all. One of, the, one of the righteous scholars, he was asked, who is the worst person okay. in this day? He, they meant the day of Arafah. He said, the worst person in this place, in this day, is the person that who thinks Allah will not forgive him. So we should have great trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will forgive us our sins. Another pious scholar, he said to, to his companions, imagine that all those people 
came to one of those generous kings, okay. worldly kings. He's a generous. And all of them, they gathered, uh, uh, begging, begging him only one cent for all of them, not to each one. Is he going to give them? They said, of course. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's easier to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant his slaves forgiveness than this sin to this king. Okay. So, by the end of the day, inshallah ta'ala, those who attended that place, imagine that they will return back, they proceed from Muzdalifah, from Arafat Muzdalifah, as the day they were born, without sins. So it's the journey of inshallah of mercy, okay. proceeding from that place. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive for our sins, and to accept our heads, our hajj and our brothers. Dr. If Dr. Muhammad has Amen. something to elaborate, he can add. Exactly. Unfortunately, Sheikh, I would love to hear what you would like to add, but uh, we pressed for time and we really have to have to go. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank you again for coming on the program and really benefiting us again. And uh, Sheikh Shafi, again, thank you very much for coming on the program and benefiting us. Inshallah, we'll see you in a future episode as well. Dear viewers, uh, I'd like to thank you for giving us your time and giving us your phone calls and giving us your feedback. We really appreciate everything that you do, your contribution on our Facebook page and also on our Twitter. Now, before we go, dear brothers and sisters, tomorrow is the day of Arafah and it's the most significant day of the year. So please, those who are doing the Hajj, we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And those who are not doing Hajj, like the scholar said, that you must fast. Those who are able to fast, you should fast. So tomorrow we will not be here. We will be in Arafat, so there's no program tomorrow. But inshallah, the day after, you will see me and you will see our guests with the same style, the same place, inshallah. And until then, I'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>